The following is a Barrett Sports Media production. Every sports media star has a story. From the highs... We are number one. We just grabbed every key demographic. <laughs> to the lows. You're fire! The path to success is always different. To help you learn more about the industry's top broadcasters, Barrett Sports Media brings you the Sports Talkers Podcast. Now, here's your host, Stephen Strom. Welcome in. My name is Stephen Strom at SSTROM underscore on Twitter. Today, John Stugatz Wiener, better known as just Stugatz, the co host of the Dan Lebitard show with Stugatz, talking about just his journey and, and who was there for him when he needed most, having a plan B, all of that to ESPN to now. Metal Arc, just a warm and insightful conversation. I mean, you, if you listen to Stu Gods, he's just a, he's a character. I mean, the laugh, the how about that. Without further ado, here is John Stu Gods Wiener. Let's first start with your journey from New York to South Florida. We were talking yeah. a little bit earlier. Um, I thought you were in finance. You had just told me that you were bartending after college. What was, I guess, the moment where you said, screw this, I'm going all in on this radio career, and what happened following that decision? Um, so I eventually did get to finance. Like, I, I eventually got there. Uh, it was down here in South Florida. Uh, I got to to finance because I was thinking perhaps the media career was not going to work out, right? So you have to have a plan B. Sure. Um, and we could discuss that further. Uh, in terms of, like, a, a seminal moment where I kind of knew like, hey, this is what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, and I've told this story before. It's, you know, where I grew up in New York, uh, they had the first 24-hour sports radio station. Uh, it was WFAN in New, uh, in New York, 660 on the AM dial. I don't know why I have to say it like that, but I do. I think they're all FM now. But um, I was listening. So my dad had picked me up from, from practice, and he was driving me home, uh, lacrosse practice. And I think it was the first time I had heard Mike and the Mad Dog. And I'm like, holy shit, these guys sound exactly like I sound. They're talking about sports the way me and my friends talk about sports, the way me and my dad talked about sports, uh, the way me and my brother talked about sports. It wasn't two athletes. It wasn't guys who played the game. It was two, uh, it was two idiots, you know? And, <laughs> and I can say that now because I've become somewhat friendly with Russo and no one's really friends with Francesa. So, um, but again, I was listening to the two guys and, and I remember asking my dad, I said, dad, what is this? And he said, Chris Russo and Mike and uh, Mike Francesa, uh, Mike and the Mad Dog. And I said, they're great. Like, they sound awesome together. And they did. You know, I asked my dad right then and there. I said, are these guys getting paid for this? And he said, yeah, they're probably getting paid a lot, a lot yeah. yeah, to do this. And so, um, you know, my dad got out of the car. We pulled into the driveway and I said, Dad, leave the car on. And I sat in the driveway and I listened for like another 20 minutes. And um, once I realized that they were talking about sports, they were doing it the way me and my friends were doing it. They were getting paid a lot of money to do it. I decided right then and there in high school, uh, dad, this is what I want to do for a living. And my dad said, go for it. So similar. So I grew up in, in New Jersey. So we both, I mean, and I, it was full circle because it's the same story, right? My dad, me and my dad were in the car. We, he, he used to put it on. Yes. He used to put it on, you know, 66 AM, 1019 FM. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, what, "What? Who are these guys? Like, this yes. is awesome!" Blah blah blah. I ended up interning for Chris when I was twenty, which was just an awesome moment for my dad too. Amazing. But my question yeah. for you, because we both Wait, have so how similar... old are you, Stephen? How old are you? Twenty four. Okay, so I want you to think about this because and think how long they've been doing this and how I many know. people they've impacted. All right, <laughs> because I am I am forty nine, dude. Okay, we're separate. You said twenty four. We're separated by twenty five years. I think if my yeah. math is correct, I'm not yeah. a math major. Um, you were influenced by the same two idiots I was influenced by. It's Think crazy. It's <laughs> crazy. The impact crazy. is wild, but um, it's just funny to hear, it, you know, it's your dad and it's my dad too. What is it about local sports radio that kind of brings a father and son together? Um, it's interesting because we have these arguments at our dinner table. We have these arguments. We compare generations with our dad. Um, we like having these conversations. We like having these arguments in a way um, that feels like, okay, we can both be right. We can both be wrong. Uh, we're going to laugh at each other at the end of the day. Because what the beauty between Mike and Chris was, Mike was laughing at Chris. I mean, he was. Yeah. But in a way that was respectful. Like, he, they knew they were doing a good show. I think what drew me to local sports, A, it's the teams that you love, right? Um, I just think, you know, talking about the teams that you love in a way that you talk about it with your friends or with your dad 
is really what draws us to, to local sports radio. I, I, I never really wanted to do national. Uh, I set out to do a local sports radio show, uh, specifically in New York. That's not you know, easier said than done. It's hard to start out in market number one. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think that's the draw of it. So you know what's funny now with First Take and, uh, and Mad Dog coming on, people have, you know, some younger people have just seen Mad Dog for the first time because not a lot of people, uh, I think my age, are, are subscribers to Sirius XM because it's sad. I mean, people think that Chris is emulating Stephen A. And it's like, no, Chris is one of one. I think Stephen A would tell you he's trying to be Chris Russo, if anything. I mean, Stephen A stands out, you know, by himself. He's one of a kind. He's, he's, he's amazing. I love him. He's fantastic. But we all gained a little, like we all learned a little something from Mike yep. and Chris. Uh, what we decided with our show was to make it a little bit more lighthearted. But the building blocks of Mike and Chris are there with Dan kind of having that Francesa role and all the credibility and, and everything that comes with that. And me having the Russo role that just let it fly, yeah. you know? That's it. If you have never heard Chris Russo, then of course you would think what it is that you just described, that he's emulating Stephen A. Smith. No, it's the other way around. We're all yep. emulating that if they were to do a good show. But uh, yeah, Chris Russo has been doing <laughs> I hear Russo so doing funny. some stuff on first take where I'm like, I've heard, I've heard him give yes. my take a thousand times The Bob times Cousy before. stuff? Oh, the, the Honda, the Havlicek. <laughs> hey, this is Stephen A. What are you doing? You know, I mean. We've heard it for our entire lives, so it's not a shock to us. But I can understand if you're in the middle of Kansas and you don't know who Chris Russo is, yep. and you have your television on, and you would think, yeah, he's just trying to be he's trying to be Stephen A. Uh, we're going to keep bouncing around. Uh, let's, I guess, because I read something on here that you got a group to to start up 790 to ticket. Can you talk about that process? Did you like? Do you still talk to these people? Do you still like? How how did that come about? Where we're going to get together and we're gonna, we're going to buy a group down here. We're going to buy a station. Okay, so just like I moved down here in 97 to South Florida from New York. Now, I moved down here not to take any sort of radio job, not because I knew I was going to get into radio. I, uh, I had just graduated college. Uh, my roommate in college was was from South Florida. Um, and so and I was bartending on the Upper West Side of New York City and, you know, living with some friends just out of college. Uh, but also, you know, still with that dream in mind of trying to get into into broadcasting. Sure. Um, I simply went, came down here and visited a friend uh, for a weekend. And I was like, holy shit, this place is awesome. I interned at WQAM. Um, wow. There was no 790 the ticket at the time. Um, and I interned for, uh, for a guy named Hank Goldberg. And a couple of years went by and there was no job to offer me. And I got a great, now I'm doing this simultaneously uh, while working for the Dolphins and the Marlins. So I was down here, you know, working in their ticket and sales office, uh, 97 for the first Marlins World Series. And I met Boog Shambi, who got me, John Shambi, who now is yep. the voice of the Cubs, but yep. just Sunday Night Baseball Forever, was part of our lineup at 790 The Ticket for a while. Um, I met him. He gave me an internship. And so I'm working for the Dolphins Marlins. I'm interning at, uh, at You're WQAM. You're hustling. I'm hustling, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the hustle. and and But they didn't have a job for me. And so, you know, and I interned on Hank show. I interned on Boog show. So two years go by, I didn't have a job. And I'm starting to think, oh, I got to, you know, I got to start making some money, like real money. Like how old are you um, at this time? 25, 24? I would say 25, 26, somewhere in that range. Sure. Um, so I took a job with the Knicks and the Rangers and I went back to, uh, I went back to New York for a year wow, and I okay. spent that. Yeah. Making good money. And you would think dream job, like, you know, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't because in I the told department. You earlier what I wanted to get into. Right. Sure. Yeah. It was in sales. And, um, but I enjoyed it, but I also spent the entire year like I'm sitting in traffic trying to get three blocks, you know, it's taking me 45 minutes. And I'm like, what the f- am I? And it's snowing. And I'm like, what the f- did I come back here for in the first place? Um, but then a funny thing happened about a year into it. Um, I get a call from Josh Darrow, who was the program director at WQAM at the time. He was also the program director when I was interning there. And he said, uh, he said, hey, I got some exciting news for you. And I said, what? He said, uh, Hank Goldberg's executive producers moved on. Uh, you made such an impression on Hank, he'd like to hire you to be the executive producer. And uh, I was like, okay, um, that is exciting news. What's it pay? He goes, that's well, here's for the news that's not that exciting. And I'm like, what's it pay, dude? He's like $4.50 an hour. And I'm like, done. Like, that's how quick the nego- Because I knew this was my foot in the door. That's you have it. to like, go you- through this part of it. It's the weeding out process kind of thing. Like, Correct. they're going to not pay, and then you got to get through. You're going to talk about it, but talk about the importance of that, because that's got to be really frustrating. I mean, it's frustrating for a lot of younger broadcasters that are excited to get into this industry. You get to the point of, oh, I'm going to interview. I'm going to do it. It's like, what? 450? Yeah. How am I supposed to do this? I got to be honest. And uh, I apologize for my dog. Um, 
So four dollars and fifty cents an hour, and and so I said, Josh, I'm going to take it, but just just give me a minute. So I called my mom and dad. I, I've said this before. Um, without my dad and my mom giving me the financial flexibility to pursue my dream, there's no way I make it. Um, there's just no way. Like they gave me what you need most in this business is in, unless you hit it big, just right off the bat, you need time. You need time, right? Mm -hmm. Because those jobs just don't. Well, they didn't pay a lot when I was growing up. They pay more now, um, and they should because they're important positions. Um, and so I called Josh back, you know, maybe, you know, yeah, I talked to my mom and dad. They were like, listen, we got you. Go do it. This is your foot in the door. This is what you wanted. This is, and at the time, Hank, it was just this big feature in sports illustrated sports illustrated. Now at the time, I don't even know if you know what that is. It was a weekly publication, a weekly magazine. You're shaking your head. Yes. But most people don't your age and younger. They usually don't. Uh, it would arrive at your door once a week. You would check out who's on the cover. It was a big deal. They did a whole spread on local sports radio. And they named like the 15 or 20 biggest shows in the country. And Hank was one of them. And so I knew to be an executive producer of a show like this was a major, major step for me. And so I moved back down here uh, with a smile on my face, $4 and 50 cents an hour. Didn't care. Mm -hmm. uh, took the job with Hank. And, and had I not taken that job, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here talking, uh, talking to you. And so just to advance that conversation forward yep. and, to, and to answer your question here with 790, I arrived at a point as as I'm producing Hank's show, I'm saying, you started to notice a couple of things that I always really paid attention to the business side of the industry. You started to notice that sports radio had blown up in such a way that you were starting to see two stations in major markets, right? Like there was audience and there was obviously an economy for two stations in a lot of markets. And uh, so I'm just like, as that started to happen, I'm thinking to myself, hey, there's got to be a younger alternative down here because QAM was, was very old, very white, sure. very yep. a lot of, you know, old school type stuff. And I'm like, there's got to be a, a, an opportunity for a younger, hipper sports radio station down here. Uh, but is there enough audience down here to 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 keep two afloat? Uh, and it, is there enough business down here to keep two afloat? Um, and so I started at least thinking about it, putting down the blueprint of, of what it would look like or feel sure. like to me. Uh, and luckily, I had two friends who were currently doing something similar in Atlanta, uh, Andrew Saltzman and Stake Shapiro, with 790 The Zone, where they didn't own the station, but they leased the station. So they had what was called a 24-hour LMA. They control the programming, the sale. They control the station. They just never owned the station. And my dog, he's very excited. He loves this part of the story. And um, and so what happened was, um, you know, I just started putting a business plan together, and I found some guys who were uh, pl uh, pretty influential down here. Uh, one guy in particular, Joel Feinberg, um, who ended up uh, being the owner of, of yep. 790 when we put it together. But I found, uh, you know, him and, and three other guys, um, you know, one had a uh, PR background, one had a, a marketing background. Um, and we had a nice, and I had a radio background and, and Joel was, was financing. And so we put together that group. I went to uh, 790 AM, just so you know, at the time, Waxy was a, they were brokering already. So it wasn't a, a they didn't have a true format. You could buy blocks of time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so with the help of Andrew and Steak showing me kind of how to do this, I negotiated all of the time. I didn't want one hour, two hours, three hours. I wanted 24 hours, seven days a week. I spoke to their uh, general, Matt Dennis Collins, who, who's uh, a great friend. And uh, we negotiated a deal, uh, at least in principle, to lease the station 24 seven. We have control of it. Call it 790 the ticket. It'd be a wow. second sports radio station in Miami. And uh, eventually we came to terms and uh, he agreed. And uh we put together what I thought was a, a tremendous lineup. And, uh, you know, we competed against WQAM. They made fun of us. They made fun of us. They made fun of us until we beat them. And then they stopped making fun of us, mm -hmm. um, not just in revenue, but in ratings as well. Um, in fact, they called me and Dan Shell. I'll never forget the GM. One of the first articles he did is they'll be out of business in a year. Uh, what Dan and Stagas are doing over there is sissy boy radio is exactly the way he put it. Um, 20, uh, let's see, 20 years later, that station is still going. It's still a sports radio station. And that Sissy Boy radio show was turned into one of the biggest radio shows in the history of radio. And we and here's the best part, because um, Hank was taking shots at me as well. I ended Hank's career. Dan and I ended Hank's career. Like we, the ratings were so big for me and Dan after a couple of years. Hank was done. And then guys that I respected and loved, Jim Mandich. Like he came on, he went against us. We put him out, you know. Yeah. Um, Unbelievable. And, and God, God rest his soul. I love Jim. Um, but we did, you know, we just, we had a good show and a good station and a good lineup. And, uh, and so we, uh, 
I would say inside of two years, we, uh, we, were, we were outrating uh, WQAM uh, and we were certainly right there in terms of revenue. And so everything I thought, hey, could, th could this market sustain uh, two sports radio stations, uh, both with ratings and, and business uh, financially, uh, that was answered pretty quickly for me because, uh, because clearly, clear, uh, clearly it was ready. And so, uh, and so that's, that's a little story there with 790. Unbelievable. Um, wow. So much there. Great stuff. Uh, you know, it's the thing that I took away from it is, you know, obviously you need to have talent for broadcast, but you also have to have that hustle element. And in your case, you're hustling, doing different internships, but at the same time, you're also, um, you're, you're hustling as far as making deals, you know, like I feel like nowadays you have a certain guy, a position at a radio station doing those things. You are, I mean, you guys are hustling. There's still stuff on YouTube of you guys at like Panther games, you guys are oh, doing yeah. live remotes. Yep. Just talk a little bit about that. Like how much did that part of, of the, of the, I guess, job help you get to this point? I think knowing all aspects of the job has really helped me. It's helped me in terms with credibility within my own staff, being able to say that Dan's a columnist, you know, like he didn't have any formal radio training. He was never an overnight board op. He wasn't interning. He wasn't grinding at 450 an hour, uh, at least not in radio. So he never pushed the buttons. He never spliced reel to reel. He never did editing. Uh, he still hasn't done any of that. Um, and I'll never have to do it. And God bless him. Um, I had to. And that helps. It helps you teach. It helps you tell stories of, hey, that like, you know, our producers come to me and say, hey, you know, and, and we've had the, you know, I had this early on. Hey, I'm only making X. And I'm like, yeah, well, I made 450 an hour. man. <laughs> so yeah. like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to hear about it. Or, hey, this, you know, the editing equipment isn't the best. And I can always fall back on, hey, try splicing real to real again. Let me know mm -hmm. how that goes. All right. <laughs> or, or try, you know, put the little A track in a little because that's. <laughs> they think but you are a ahead. jack of all trades, though. When I you really am. Kind of think yeah. about it. You're old school. Yeah. Yeah, I've done sales. Um, you know, the shows always lean on me uh, for for the business side of this stuff um, and the sales and the sales relationships and all that stuff. I think it's important to do all that stuff. It, it gives you a better understanding of what it is your team is going through at certain times uh, of a show. Uh, some of the frustration, some of the highs, some of the lows, because you've been there and you've done it and you can relate to them. And relatability is not only with your staff, but with your audience is, is kind of what my whole career uh, has been about. And so, um, yeah, that, those days were invaluable to me yep. that th those experiences were invaluable to me. Um, and they really kind of, you know, they really kind of helped me uh, get to where it is to where it is, uh, you know, where I'm at today. And so, uh, I'm just excited. Listen, it all worked out. There were times where I was worried it would not work out. You know, I always had like a backup plan. I always yes. had this, like I had that in mind. I like, there had to be a date where like a line of the say, like, Hey, if I don't make it, I gotta go do something else. Because what I always had in the back of my head was I didn't want mom and dad to have to float me for too long. Like it's not fair to them. Yep. Um, and plus, you know, I wanted I wanted to make my own money. I wanted I wanted to do my own stuff. And so, um, yeah. But that those days, all of those days, the 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 climb of the the producing climb up to what my own show was probably uh, the most invaluable experience that I've had. Hundred uh, percent. Stu Gotts with us. Two more quick ones with him. So. Here's the one. I mean, there's a couple of things that kind of worry me about this industry. One of them is almost the burnout factor. Yeah. And you've been doing this for a long time, but you know, you're married, you have kids, you are a coach, you know, how important do you think that was, I guess, having this over the mountaintop view, there has been multiple people that have kind of just been career 100% and they miss out on having a family. They miss out on having kids. What has that brought you as far as balance to your career and your family? Uh, Steven, it's helped a lot because, yeah, like having a family, having some things outside of this helped. I noticed it with Hank. Like, I'm like, Hank wasn't married. Um, not that he burned out. It was just, I remember this being everything that he had, right? And listen, it takes a toll on the family. I'll tell you, my family has lived through it. Like, I have two daughters who are now... Uh, seniors in high school, headed to college. I have a wife. Uh, the, the the nature of the role I play on our show, it's not easy. Like they hear things they don't want to hear. They hear Dan yelling at me sometimes. They hear me yelling back. They hear, and sometimes you take it home. And um, I think when I, you know, kind of learned and got old enough to say, hey, you know, Dan and I are just doing a show. That's what it is. Um, you know, my mom would call me and she'd be like, oh, he's such an ass, right? And I'd be like, mom, we're doing a show like, OK, I know this man, like we're doing a show. And I'm not to say Dan's not an ass occasionally <laughs> he is, but so am I. OK, but that's the key to our longevity is like we know our roles. Uh, we make fun of ourselves. We laugh at ourselves. Uh, but I think we both I think Dan would tell you the same thing. We have some interest outside 
uh, of the radio show. Um, so being able to, you know, kind of go home, have way more important things to deal with once you get home to kind of, even if you want to focus on this, you can't, cause you got to focus on that stuff. It's more important. Um, definitely helped me in terms of preventing a uh, burnout, the nature of the role that I play with Dan, knowing what I'm going to be doing every day, not guessing, really just being who I am on air, um, really prevented the burnout. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, you don't want to recharge the batteries or maybe look to do something different or new sure. down the road. Uh, of course you do. But um, I will tell you that for for a good 20 years, um, what came before even, and, and there's no regret with this. It's the way you have to build. And my wife bought in because she saw where we were going um, and she knew that I was happy and I was living my dreams out professionally. Um, but um you know, I, I, I so, so she was good, but it's very taxing. Um, of course, on the family, and I will tell you that for twenty years, that show came first. Like it didn't matter what I was doing; if they needed me, I would drop what I was doing from a family standpoint, and I would have to go address the show. But that's just the way this industry is, especially if you want to make it have the success and longevity uh, that we've had. I will tell you that now that I've arrived here, where I've arrived, and I've been here for a bit. Uh, the next phase of this, because my kids are going to college and my wife now needs her husband. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, the next phase, the next phase of this, whether it's with Dan and I'm not saying that it won't be, or whether it's something new, uh, down the road, they will come first, like mm. period end of this. They put up with me for 20 years and now it's, it's time to put them first. So whatever, whatever it is I do here moving forward, even if it is staying with Dan, and but having to do shows from, from different places, whatever it is, um, the need of my wife and the need of my children who are now going to be in college and my desire to want to see my daughter play uh, the highest level, a uh, level of her sport, which is college. Congratulations, across. by the way. Yeah, That's thanks, man. Fantastic. It's awesome. It's awesome. We're being there for my other daughter, Emma, at uh, who's, who's, who's going to be going to Syracuse. That stuff moving forward now has to and will take priority over anything to do with the show in the industry, just because um, they've always allowed me to make the show the priority. And now it's time to kind of pay them back and be there for my wife at a time where she really needs mm. me. She, she's kind of defined by her children. Her children are going off to college and it's that, you know, I feel bad for Abby, but she needs to gots and she got plans, <laughs> on, being, <laughs> she got plans on being there for my wife. Okay? <laughs> oh God. What a perfect way to put it. I know you've been excited for this one. I texted you this because I didn't want to throw you on the spot because I've yeah. done this with a couple of people with the Mount Rushmore I thing. Know, I mean, and they're like, Oh, you got to give me more time. Steven and I said all right all right I'm gonna Steven, give I've you been more agonizing. time I'm telling you right now I've been agonizing over this and you, since you sent me the text I Mount mean. Rushmore of South Florida broadcasters it could be radio hosts it could be play-by-play -play. give me Stu Gatz's Mount Rushmore of South Florida broadcasters all right I am only going to give you radio host dude like I'm not perfect play-by-play -play. uh although Jim Mandish probably, that's Zaslow has Zaslow had him on his list too uh zaslo is well zaslo is not on my list I no no i know list. he had okay. mandage on his list though i don't know i'm teasing um one day though zaslo will be on someone's list i promise you um he might be on my list one day i love Zaz. <laughs> you put mad dog on his list huh mm -hmm. the respect we all have for jim mandage is like yeah it's crazy all right i gotta start with hank okay uh hank goldberg is is on that list Mm -hmm. uh, listen, I'm not going to put myself on there. I'm not putting Levitard. We're not on Mount Rushmore's yet, okay? Like, that's then I'll start, I'll really start feeling old, okay? okay. Uh, I'm not going to put Hockman on that list, although he's old enough to be on that list. Um, so I'm going to say Hank because Hank really had, Hank was was the first big show down here. Hank's got to be on there. Yeah, Hank's on there. Um, it doesn't have to be sports, right? No. Just broadcasters. I think anyone who puts together who's my age, a Mount Rushmore of South Florida radio personalities that doesn't have Neil Rogers on it Neil uh, Rogers, is, yep. is making a colossal mistake. Neil is Neil for my money might be the greatest ever. I've done this period. Just talk, just talk show, just the best. Like, and I, and so for me at the time, Hank show came right behind, right after Neil's show. Uh, it was the morning show midday uh, afternoon. And mm -hmm. so it was Neil 10 to two, Hank two to six. When George Rodriguez was out, I got the um, I had the pleasure of being able to to uh, to produce Neil's show. So I saw the genius like right in front of me, like just having conversations with himself and different characters. Amazing. So mm. let's go on. Uh, Neil, the, the, he's the greatest. Neil, Hank, uh, the god of, of, of late night talk radio, Ed Kaplan. I love him. He's so ahead Ooh. of his time gambling. Oh, he was Dan and I talking about him all the time. <laughs> like just he was so ahead. He. 
Ed Kaplan back then is where we're at now in terms of talking about gambling, breaking. Like he was great and he was perfect for night. Little like, pioneer. Like, All right. Yeah. Pioneer. And the last one, uh, listen, there's no way we start 790 to take it without him. Um, and he's still doing it now and he's still doing it at a fairly high level. Uh, but if you're not putting Joe Rose on that list, you're making Oh, a yeah. So I'm going big dog. I'm going Neil. I'm going Hank. I'm going Ed Kaplan. Fantastic. And my apo- and my apologies to uh, to Ken Malden, who's the greatest update anchor I've ever heard. So um, and Phil Shane too, both legends. I mean, just and Mandich. I mean, those 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 are the three people I have some major regret le- uh, leaving off this list. So. John, I I, I can't Depot. I can't thank you enough <laughs> for uh, for joining me. This was a fantastic yeah, spot. Man. Keep up the great work. It was great meeting you. And um, thank you again for carving out some time for me. All right. And this is how much uh, Russo has influence, uh, influenced us. The reason Steven says spot, the reason I'll say, hey, great spot, is only because we heard Christopher Mando yeah. say oh, it my. a thousand times. Right? <laughs> great spot. Great, <laughs> spot, a great spot, Mike. Mike, Mike, uh, you know what I mean? What a great spot that was, Mike. I mean, uh. <laughs> Perfect way to Steven, end it. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate this. Of this course, man. Event. Thank you again. Yeah, All, All right. right. Stu Gotts, everybody. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this interview make sure to rate subscribe and review we're on apple Podcasts. we are on spotify we're on everything jason and dimitri are taking care of us we're trying to grow this thing i uh, got some really good feedback on week one we're trying to get even better feedback on week two and if you have negative feedback man just tweet me i i want this thing to be productive for everybody if you have questions that you may want to hear we like to drop the guest a couple days before this comes out so if you guys have any questions that i think would be appropriate for the interview i'm glad to throw that in so thanks everyone for listening have a fantastic rest of your weekend for barrett sportsmedia.com i'm steven strom see you next week thank you for listening to the sports talkers podcast with steven strom a reminder that each episode can be found on itunes spotify and most podcasting platforms to stay up to date on future episodes visit barrett sportsmedia.com